A lot of times it's some type of limiting belief or assumption, like I can't say no or push back or negotiate for more resources because this is my boss and I have no power. I think a lot of people um, have power that they don't use. In fact, there's a lot of research that backs up that one of the largest abuses of power is not using it. Right, friends, this is your host, Dr. Solomon. How can we communicate when we work at distance, when we work remotely and we cannot see each other in person? My guest today, Rebecca Zucker, will help us answer this tough question. Rebecca is not only a dear friend of mine, she has an accolade of many contribution to business and to leadership. She graduated from NYU with honors degree in business, She pursued her MBA at Stanford. She worked as investment banker at Goldman Sachs in New York. And after this career, she went to become an executive coach. She's a member of the MG100 Coaches. She is a regular contributor of HBR. And she has been in a leadership position at Disney Paris. Rebecca Zucker, welcome on Thrive. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me today. Rebecca, let's start with the working at distance situation. People now have to work at a distance and they do not really have a chance to meet each other in person. In the past, someone will drop by your office and say, hey, I didn't receive a reply from you. And they say, oh, sorry, I forgot about that. And then you can get back to them. How can we do this now? How to follow up with someone who is not getting back to you on time? Great question. Well, as you mentioned, we don't have the benefit of just swinging by their desk anymore. And, you know, a lot of work was happening remotely before the pandemic. Of course, now virtually all work is happening remotely with the pandemic. And I think there are a few just basic guidelines to follow. Recognize that one, people are very busy and have other priorities that may not be the same as yours. And sending a quick reminder Uh, Subject line is key. Keep it short and keep the message short. Also, recognizing that a lot of people are reading their emails on a smartphone or a tablet um, and want to make it easy for them and make a clear ask. And when you say the subject line should be specific, what would you recommend as a subject line? Well, it should be specific, but it should also be short. Mm -hmm. So ideally around four words, if you can keep it that short. Mm -hmm. Uh, Any specific formula you follow? Well, keep it relevant to the topic. And if it's time sensitive, definitely indicate that. Uh, Mm -hmm. It could be something like response needed on project X, Mm -hmm. whatever that might be. Or um, timeline for project Y, if you're wanting to know the timing of something in particular, let's say. So it really depends on information that you're seeking from another person. The other thing, depending on who you're reaching out to, it might be another colleague internally, it might be an external stakeholder of some kind, but also giving them an out. So say, for example, that you want a colleague's input on a proposal that you're writing or a pitch to a new client, and you want their input because they've worked on a lot of these projects before, and it would be really valuable. First of all, mentioning how valuable it would be uh, is really important to the message, and subtle flattery doesn't hurt either. And letting them know also, if you need more time for this, please let me know. Or if this just doesn't work for you, please let me know. So giving them an out can help you get a response. Even if that response is not what you want to hear, at least you close the loop. Because a lot of times people, uh, they avoid negative feelings or things like awkwardness, or I feel badly declining this person, or I just don't have time and I don't have the hearts to just say it outright. Um, giving them an out will allow them to say, listen, it's not a good time. Could we look at this some other time? And regarding the tone of these messages, as you know, emails and messages do not necessarily convey tones. Would you have any recommendations regarding how the message could be direct, but at the same time sensitive and accommodating for whatever could be on the other person plate? Yes. So you never want to make the other person feel badly. You want to let them save face, even if they are really uh, delinquent and getting back to you on something. So recognizing, I'm sure you're really busy, wanted to bring this back to your attention or bring it up to the top of your inbox. 
And you, you don't want to shame anybody or make them feel badly. That just doesn't work. So giving them some grace there is really important and can get you better results as well. Mm-hmm. And also, I would say if something is really urgent um, and it's somebody you know reasonably well and you can just call them and they can hear your tone of voice so that they can hear you're not irked or annoyed or peeved in any way, but hey, listen, this would be really helpful. I just want to flag this in your inbox or shoot a quick text to um, to let them know that that email is in their inbox and if they could pay attention to it, that would be terrific. It's interesting that you're mentioning phone calls. Old school. Yes, yeah, I was about to say it's almost going out of fashion. What's your take on that? Well, I think it's particularly helpful when hearing your tone of voice can ease the tension or uh, preempt potential tension in a situation. So if let's just say you're dealing with a colleague where you have a difficult or strained relationship, in particular, they can hear that your voice is friendly Mm -hmm. and understanding. It can put things at ease a little bit. Yes. Yeah, indeed. And do you think people might misinterpret cold calls as intrusive? Well, I don't think of them them as cold calls because you're actually not trying to catch them live. That's a cold call and that can be somewhat intrusive. I get annoyed at that as well. Um, But it's more just leaving a voicemail that they don't need to return. It's just, hey, FYI, sent you this email, wanted to flag it for you. If you could get back to me by end of day, that would be terrific. Oh, that's actually a wonderful idea. Just leaving the voice message and then it is up to the person to reply at their convenience, similar to an email. Right. Yeah. So let's shift gears now to also another topic that's related to working from home, but slightly different angle. We are now seeing some companies start to hire more people as the vaccine is released and people are getting vaccinated. There is more trust in economy. And people have to work with others whom they haven't seen, they haven't interacted with before. And there's also limited opportunity during the onboarding process to have these people meet and greet and mingle. It's it's not like before. What would you recommend regarding collaboration with someone whom you don't really know and they are new on the team? Well, I would say first get to know them. Uh, make that personal connection. And I think that's really important. And even for colleagues who've been working in the same organization, you might not, neither of you might be a you know, new employee, but taking time to step back and look at how you want to do the work. A lot of people for the sake of efficiency and because we all have so much to do, just dive right in. And that can get some initial progress and momentum, but what typically happens is that there is inevitably a stumbling block Mm -hmm. around how you're working together. And even very well-meaning people uh, who have good intentions can uh, find themselves in this situation. So taking a step back before diving in, looking at, hey, what are our goals for this project? What's the process that we wanna use to get this work done? And then also, what's the division of labor? Who will do what by when? And determining that, that's a big area of confusion oftentimes in projects is who is doing what. Mm -hmm. And then also, what's your preferred work style? Do you like to brainstorm a lot first and then go away and do further work and then reconvene and so on? Or is it some other um, way you prefer working? And Also, when and how will you give each other feedback on how you're working together? And establishing that upfront can be really useful because it avoids the awkwardness of having to figure that out when there is feedback to give so that you've already established various touch points where you're going to say, so how's this going for you? What's going well? What do you think could be going better in some way to work effectively together? And it's taken um, you know, with the good intentions that it's meant to, and it doesn't feel as awkward or um, personal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are key things. And just, you know, what do you need to do your best work? So making clear requests of each other. And as a result of those requests, making clear agreements upfront about how you'll work together. So for example, um, somebody might say, 
you know, weekend emails really stress me out. So unless it's something that's super urgent, if we could wait till Monday, that would be awesome. Since most of the work now is done online, is done through softwares, through social media, what would be your recommendation regarding giving feedback through indirect way like this? How to be still direct, but sensitive? Yes, I recommend live, like you and I are talking now. You don't want to give feedback, particularly improvement feedback through email. You mm -hmm. want to be able to have a conversation, again, hear the person's tone of voice, know that they're coming from a good place, and to really be able to ask those clarifying questions live around um, the feedback and the impact that the individual had and what to do about it next is really important. Mm -hmm. And this is because the loss of tone or intention in written communication. Is that correct? Yes, a lot can be lost in an email and feedback is just an emotional process, even positive feedback. I mean, I've had clients cry at positive feedback <laughs> just <laughs> as much as improvement feedback. And uh, given that it's important to establish that rapport and have that real time back and forth that email does not really allow for. Mm -hmm. Before we move to the next part, I'd like to ask people watching us to look up Rebecca Zucker's website on nextsteppartners.com, Rebecca-Zucker, to know more about her work, her blogs, her articles. You can also follow her on Twitter at rszucker, one word, and she would be happy to communicate with you, share her experience, and do not forget to subscribe to the channel and share the link so that others will benefit from Rebecca's expertise. Rebecca, since we're talking about communication in the virtual world, it is not a secret that one of the downsides of working remotely uh, is that it encouraged or allowed, to be more accurate, more passive aggressive behaviors. It is good to give benefit of the doubt, but sometimes, as you know, it might not be the case. What's your take on that? Well, as you mentioned, always give the benefit of the doubt. If somebody says that they will do something and they haven't followed through on it, let them know that they haven't followed through and ask what happened. And there might be something that you can do to help facilitate them getting done what they need to get done. It may be that it just fell off their list or they forgot about it. Or there were higher priorities, things that were more pressing or urgent. Uh, in the case where somebody says yes, but means no, <laughs> it's typically when somebody is conflict avoidant, but they're not going to tell you no. And there, I think it's really a question of accountability and mm -hmm. getting into what is the real issue? Is this still something that you feel like that you can do? And if you can't, I need to know that too. Uh, they may not have a choice if they do that or not really depends on the situation. But holding people accountable is key. It's also, I think, you know, part of the work that I do is to work with a conflict avoidant person to show them that conflict is actually normal. It would be very strange to believe that we could operate a business and not have conflict. Mm -hmm. So you should expect to have conflicts and disagreements. And you may not want to do something, but you know, when someone asks you something, there's always three answers you can give yes, no, and counter offer. So um, showing them by experience that leaning into those difficult conversations can actually, one is not so bad. And two, uh, that it can actually build the relationship with the other person. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean exactly by the counter offer? Well, it might be, yes, I can do this for you, but it's going to take a week longer mm -hmm. or yes, I can do this if you give me this extra budget or this other person to help me work on it. So it's negotiating for the resources that you feel like you need. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Or yes, I can do this if I can delegate this other project to somebody else or deprioritize it. On this note from working long experience now as executive coach, what have you seen as common resistance reasons for people who try to avoid conflict and they tell you that they can't say no because dot, dot, dot. That's a great question. I think it's a few things. I think conflict avoidance is just part of human nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people are more feelers versus thinkers. People who are feelers uh, prefer harmony 
And so conflict feels really uncomfortable for them. Uh, so not to say they can't be good at handling it. It's not a question of skill, but it's more a comfort level in dealing with it. And sometimes it's just a skill level. They don't know how to have that conversation. And so being able to role play that conversation with a coach or understand how the various frameworks, how they might structure that conversation um, could be getting in the way. But a lot of times it's some type of limiting belief or assumption. Like I can't say no or push back or negotiate for more resources because this is my boss and I have no power. I think a lot of people um, have power that they don't use. In fact, there's a lot of research that backs up that one of the largest abuses of power is not using it. <laughs> oh, no. this is interesting. I haven't heard this before. One of the largest abuse of power yes. is not using it. Yes. Well, we have more power than we think we have. Mm -hmm. And certainly when we're dealing with our boss or other superiors, it can feel risky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one perspective I take is they're just people, mm -hmm. you know, and the answer, the, the worst thing is the answer is no. As long as you conduct yourself professionally, mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, the, the cost is not that great. So, but having said that, some people don't work in environments that have a lot of psychological safety. So that's understandable that they may not feel comfortable pushing back or challenging. They may feel like there are real adverse consequences to that. And that might be the case if it's that type of environment. So I just want to acknowledge that um, not everybody works in an environment that feels completely psychologically safe, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And in situations like this, what would you recommend for someone who is conflict avoidant to use their power, say something, but at the same time, not jeopardize their career? That's a great question. This is stuff that you can practice even outside of the workplace. You can practice it with friends, with family members, spouses. And the more we lean into the difficult conversations, the more we can build our confidence that we have the ability to do that. And, you know, listen, I do this for a living and difficult conversations are still difficult. I don't look forward to them, <laughs> but A, I prepare for them, which makes them go a lot better. And when they go a lot better, I can say, okay, that wasn't so bad. I can do this again next time if I need to. And we can only control ourselves. We can't control the other person's reaction. Uh, a great tool that we use is something that we call shared intent, which a lot of difficult conversations don't happen because people don't know how to start the conversation. And shared intent is how to start the conversation, which is effectively putting out a shared goal that both people can get behind. So it could be something to the effect of, you know, I think we both want this project to go well. So I'd like to talk about how we might work more effectively together. Mm -hmm. Or whatever so, that is. Finding a common goal or a common background or a common point to start with and go from there. Right. And sometimes you have to zoom out quite a bit to get to that common point. Sometimes I'll hear from people, well, I just want them to change. Okay. For the benefit of what? What will be better for them, for you, for the team, for the client or the customer or the organization if they were to change or do this differently? And go with that. What is the higher level benefit? That they can that you can both get behind. And people get defensive because they don't feel safe. And so what this is doing by establishing your shared intent, you're creating safety in the conversation and inviting the person to engage. And it doesn't mean they're not going to get defensive. That could still happen. Again, we can't control what's going on for them or the lens that they are taking to the conversation. But um, at least we can help set the stage for that. Now I'll ask you a question that they ask every guest on Thrive. Uh, we all had setbacks, Rebecca, all of us. And we managed somehow to move from striving to thriving. Would you mind sharing one of yours and how did you overcome it? Oh, wow. So striving to thriving. I remember when I, um, so I had left Disney. I was still living in Paris and I, I moved back to the States and it happened to be the height of the internet boom. And none of it was really in France. So I came back to the Bay Area. I live in San Francisco, really to this totally foreign <laughs> place, uh, you know, foreign. foreign, 
Well, yes. And I will say I definitely had reverse culture shock, which I don't wish on anybody. And uh, it was the height of the internet boom. Like I said, none of it was in France. And uh, it was culturally quite a shock. Mm -hmm. And just to get my bearings took some time and I had taken some time off after Disney. So not only getting my bearings, but figuring out what did I want to do professionally? And I ended up uh, going back to banking, but in a training capacity and got a great job running uh, learning and development at a regional investment bank. And yet that still wasn't the end game for me. So from striving to thriving, it was really about being patient and trying several things on. And, uh, you know, I worked with a coach myself to help really reflect and look at, uh, what my values were, what got me excited, what's the work that I love to do. And it all pointed me towards the career that I do now, where I've been doing this for 19 years. I love what I do. And, uh, I consider myself to be thriving. So it was definitely a journey. It's not a quick fix. Uh, so if you are in the striving part of things, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You just need to keep going. It's a lot of, um, it's the four P's that I call patience, persistence, and pounding the pavement. It's getting out there and talking to people, crafting experiments, um, keeping what fits, what you like, and iterating to get to that place where you feel um, like you're thriving, like you said. Mm -hmm. And what helped you during this journey? I assume there were doubts. I assume there were questions about oh, why would I leave a well-paid, stable job to a career that I love, but still risky and uncertain? A good question. I think what helped was really tuning out some of what we call the shoulds, like I should be doing this. I had a lot of people telling me, oh, you were a banker, uh, you should do business development. And so first I had to figure out what business development was. Then I tried business development and I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I like the creativity of it, trying to figure out who to partner with. Uh, that was very interesting. So worked with a startup for a couple of months doing some consulting there. And it, it was not the end game for me, but it was a good experiment. And, you know, I think healthy skepticism can be good just because other people say, this would be good for you doesn't mean that it necessarily is. Sometimes they're projecting your va their values on you. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, what I see with a lot of people making career transition is that there are the opportunities that are logical in mm -hmm. terms of a next step for them and easy to market themselves as doing. But is that the right thing for them? Is that what's going to make them happy? A lot of people have been on autopilot for 20 to 30 years and haven't really thought about what makes them fulfilled or what they enjoy doing. They've just sort of taken the next opportunity that comes. And so taking the opportunity to real, really take that step back and figure that out. And so working with a coach was a key part of that. I think also not rushing myself. I, like I said, I did some consulting to pay the bills, but gave myself time uh, to figure it out. And I didn't work five days a week when I was doing the consulting because I wanted that space. It's not just a question of time, it's space to reflect and figure that out. That is terrific. I really love what you said about the autopilot because most of us are an autopilot. There is a point where we need to stop and say, is this really what I want? Right. And it can be easy to be seduced by title and money and all these other things that might get thrown at you. But is it really what makes you excited? How did you deal with moments of, I would not say regret, but moments of doubt while you are successful as executive coach, but you said, well, this aspect of investment banking was really good. I missed this part. Um, I didn't have moments of doubt. It was more, what do I want to take from prior experiences and keep mm -hmm. and what else might I want to add to that? So a good example was I love the client service aspect of investment banking. I loved working with senior leaders like CEOs and CFOs and super smart people that were my colleagues at Goldman Sachs. I still get those things in the, the work that I do and the firm that I've built. And I also get to express my values of adventure and independence in running and building my own business. So it's a yes and as opposed to a yes, but. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and not yes, but. 
Thank you for sharing this, Rebecca. Anything you would like to share with your audience that you have not shared before on other podcasts? Well, I would say we just came out with the third edition of our career handbook for working professionals, and it's a great 235-page resource for any working professional, whether you're employed or in transition, and a whole bunch of content and exercises that really address any aspect of the career transition process. And you can see more about that at nextsteppartners.com slash career dash tools. You get it in digital format and printed format, uh, which is through Amazon. And uh, MIT just bought 300 copies, uh, Stanford and Harvard Business School is a private label prior edition. So it speaks to a very high caliber audience and um, really a good soup to nuts resource. Congratulations on this, Rebecca. What a pleasure to have you on Thrive. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being with me today. Our audience watching us today, please remember to check Rebecca's website at nextsteppartners.com. You can follow her on the Twitter account. The link will be in the description below. Till we meet next time, keep safe, keep motivated, keep resilient, and see you in the next episode of Thrive. Thank you.